talks here. Uh, it's only kind of tangent, tangentially uh, related to the Trail of Tears. Um, but I wanted to use this opportunity to reach out to members of the, the Senate community and, and uh, people interested in Native American history here in North Alabama um, that we might not ordinarily reach through our consultations. Um, so I want to thank the uh, conference organizers for giving me a little time today. Um, anybody hear me okay? Uh, I don't have a remote for this. So I'm going to stand right here and flip through my slides. Um, there we go. So Redstone Arsenal, it's uh, 38,182 acres total. Uh, makes it a medium-sized army installation compared to some of the big massive installations out in uh, the southwest and so forth. Um, it was started in 1941 as part of the mobilization leading up to World War II. Uh, its original mission was uh, manufacture of chemical weapons and chemical constituents produced in World War II. Um, so the north part of the arsenal is a lot of old manufacturing facilities, uh, fairly contaminated by a lot of the uh, runoff and everything from these manufacturing facilities. And then they'd store a lot of the munitions uh, down the south end of the arsenal. And we don't have any sites that we've definitely uh, attributed to uh, the Trail of Tears or associated with the Trail of Tears. But our southern boundary is the Tennessee River, so it did touch us. Um, in the late 40s, uh, after World War II, they switched the focus of installation towards um, the headquarters of the Army Ballistic Missile Program, and they moved those Project Paperclip German rocket scientists uh, on post. And since then, our, our mission's been very focused on uh, rocket and missile technologies. Um, There's a lot of cooks in the kitchen as far as federal agencies go here. Uh, the Army manages the biggest chunk of real estate, but they weren't the first ones on the scene. Uh, back in the 1930s, the Fish and Wildlife Service established uh, Wheeler Wildlife Refuge along the river there, and about 5,000 some acres of that overlap uh, with us. Uh, TVA impounded Wheeler uh, Lake in 1934, uh, so they overlap with us. Um, NASA, one of the original NASA facilities, Marshall Space Flight Center, was established right in the center of the arsenal, and they own nearly 2,000 acres. But the Army has land use agreements with all these earlier uh, folks, uh, so we manage most of the land. Uh, NASA is the only one that does, does their own cultural resource management. But that central part of the installation has been so impacted over the years and built up that they don't have a whole lot of uh, cultural resources left. So here we are in the geological scheme of things. Um, we're at a, a kind of unique interface between a couple of different physiographic regions. Uh, we've got the, the Highland Brim um, and then the Cumberland Plateau. And uh, you can see some of these mountains on the topo maps. There's a few mountains on the arsenal there are these Cumberland Plateau outliers. So it's, uh, from an archaeological standpoint and an ecological standpoint, it's kind of a neat range of these different ecosystems and different environments, ranging from the Tennessee River up the floodplain and then up into some of these Cumberland Plateau outliers. <coughs> uh, so we call that ecotone. Um, it's where prehistoric hunter-gatherers especially could exploit a couple different ecological communities and uh, have a lot more resources they could exploit. So my job at Redstone Arsenal is to uh, help the Army um, comply with different cultural resources and preservation laws. So the big one being National Historic Preservation Act. Um, and that covers any buildings over 50 years old that uh, we consider historic, archeological sites and uh, historic cemeteries and so forth. So our, our built environment on Redstone Arsenal is all the uh, historic buildings, uh, our oldest being the only uh, pre-arsenal structure left, which is this 1923 farmhouse. Um, the majority of our historic buildings are uh, these ugly things, they're called earth-covered storage magazines. 
and we've got 300 some of these, they all date to World War II, and that's where they stored a lot of the munitions and chemical weapons that they manufactured. Um, and uh, Marshall Space Flight Center has a whole slew of historic buildings related to uh, the Saturn rocket program, uh, but we don't manage those. A lot of those are actually listed on the National Register for good reason. Um, so the main part of our management is going out and finding uh, our historic resources. So buildings are, are uh, you know, we've got a complete record of that. So we'll do an archival research and figure out when these buildings were built. Uh, we'll get architectural historians to come in, evaluate the buildings, and see if they meet the criteria uh, for the National Register. Um, archaeological sites are a little trickier. Uh, we actually have to go out and do physical archaeological surveys to locate these things. Um, and this map is uh, individual survey parcels that we've used uh, since the survey began in 1978. Um, and since then we've recorded 994 sites to date. Um, and that's about half of all the uh, archaeological sites that have been recorded in Madison County, Alabama so far. Um, that's just the ones on Army managed land. There's a few more on Marshall Space Flight Center, maybe another dozen or so archaeological sites. But when you factor it all in, it comes to, um, I said that's the wrong number, it should be 31 archaeological sites per acre. Uh, kind of the rule of thumb for planning archaeological surveys in, in eastern North America is 40 sites per acre. So, um, or no, one site per 40 acres. We have one site per 31 acres. So the site density is um, pretty extraordinary for this area, and that's probably due to the Tennessee River being there. Uh, major transportation corridor through time, lots of natural resources. Um, there's, that's just to give you an idea of the distribution of the archaeological sites. They're everywhere. Um, we've got 994, uh, about 600 some have uh, prehistoric or Native American components. Um, 511 are just pure prehistoric components. Uh, another 179 have minor prehistoric components, but the main components are historic. So like uh, 1930s sharecropper shacks, plantations, things like that. Um, the prehistoric sites include things like um, little Paleo-Indian or archaic lithic scatters, um, just scatters of, of flint debitage and stone tools that were left behind in small hunter-gatherer camps. Um, big middens from villages where you get a lot of accumulation of artifacts and debris over time. Uh, we've got a few mounds, at least one burial mound, uh, one uh, more of a ceremonial middle woodland platform mound. Um, anyone see the Florence mound in uh, the field trip over the Shoals area in Florence? It's a big platform mound, dates to the same time period, it was probably used the same way as our mound. Uh, we've got mortuary caves where middle woodland people um, bury their dead, and then historic sites, plantations, small farms, tenant farms, uh, river ferries, um, lots of whiskey stills from the uh, early 20th century. And the reason we find all these is to help the Army figure out what they need to preserve and avoid keep from impacting. Um, and there's a whole rubric in the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966 that we have to work through to see if the sites, the archaeological sites, meet that criteria. And when you do that, about uh, not quite half uh, meet that criteria for preservation. Uh, just a little bit on the, on the breakdown of the prehistoric components, um, what kind of ages they're associated with. Uh, this is all the sites, I think there's, uh, about 400 some that we can actually, you know, they have diagnostic artifacts that we can figure out how old they are and what cultures they're associated with. Um, and it's kind of intuitive. The, the very early ones, going back 13,000 years, or early Paleo Indian, we've just got a handful. And you can kind of see the population increase through time until it peaks in the late archaic, about 3,000 years ago. And we've got this strange dip in the early woodland period talk about that more in a minute. Um, and then the number of sites kind of drop off through time. And we don't know if this, you know, 
site numbers, component numbers are kind of an um, imperfect proxy for human population sizes. Uh, population size probably had a little bit to do with it, but also when you get to the middle woodland period, people are starting to consolidate the populations into permanent villages. Prior to that, it's a lot of mobile hunter-gatherers, which created smaller sites and more sites on the landscape. So this is probably uh, more representative of, of uh, fewer sites being a result of uh, more people packed onto these sites. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about this historic spot in a minute. This is historic Native American, uh, and right now we only have a single site that we've uh, had diagnostic artifacts that uh, were historic pre. So when you, we have 84 chronometric dates from Redstone Arsenal. Uh, most of those are radiocarbon and accelerator mass spectrometry um, dates. Uh, and when you map where those dates fall in the time sequence, it, it looks pretty similar. Um, the Paleo-Indian sites we've got zero dates for. They're super old, not a lot of organic preservation. Most of those sites are up in the uplands where uh, they've been exposed to cultivation and uh, disturbance over the years. So not much organic stuff there. But once you get to the early archaic, um, you start getting organics and you start seeing these radiocarbon dates accumulating. Um, this was the peak in the site numbers, um, but the reason the middle woodland is so overrepresented is because we focused on some of these middle woodland middens, uh, these rich village sites, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But uh, in focusing on those, we ended up with a whole slew of radiocarbon dates that kind of skew the data. Curiously, we've got this dip in the early woodland again. So this is uh, between about. Uh, Oh, 4,000 BC and um, 300 BC or so. Uh, we just do not have a lot of dates from that time period. So that suggests that previous chart where um, it showed a dip in the site numbers, something is actually going on there, whether it was a population crash in the early woodland period or whether um, the, the early woodland groups in the Tennessee Valley had a buffer area between them that just coincided on Redstone Arsenal where it was kind of a depopulated area between population groups. We don't know for sure. Um, so here's our, our one historic Native American site on Redstone Arsenal and it's represented by these three uh, Chattahoochee brush pot sherds which are historic creek pottery uh, dating between around 1600 and 1800 AD. Um, and they're in a scatter <coughs> found right down here on the river bank, just kind of a nice little concentrated scatter, um, along with uh, what we call Gunnersville points, which are these uh, late chipstone uh, arrow points that are uh, distinctive. Uh, started using those in the late prehistoric, but historic Creek people were using those too. Um, we've got gun flints that are both English gun flints and, and uh, bifacial Aboriginal chip gun flints, made a local material, uh, and a few metal objects like uh, uh, shank buttons dating to the early 1800s, possibly late 1700s, probably from uh, big gray coats or something similar. So we think this is probably uh, a Muscogee Creek campsite right there on the river. Uh, by this time, most of the uh, Muscogee Creek had moved down to the uh, upper towns on the Coosa and Telapusa valleys, uh, but the deerskin trade was forcing them to expand their hunting territories back into uh, some of the, their uh, traditional homelands on the Tennessee River. So this is probably where a, a hunting group camped right on the river. And the interesting thing about it, um, that middle woodland platform mound I was talking about is just inland from that, uh, maybe about a, a hundred meters inland from this site. <laughs> And we've got evidence that after the Middle Woodland period, people stopped at this spot again and again and again. Um, so this creek camp may coincide with that uh, tradition of people like, hey, we're going to meet at the, the mound. Um, in the Middle Woodland period, this is an aggregation point where different uh, Middle Woodland clans around the Tennessee Valley would uh, congregate here, you know, whether it was every year or twice a year or seasonally. Um, to meet with each other, exchange gifts, have fees, conduct ceremonies, uh, 
meet mates, whatever. Um, and we think this was probably probably remain in the tradition as a, a annual meeting spot for people all the way in the historic times. Uh, so all this data, when we go out and find these archaeological sites, we'll GPS everything now. We've got these nice submeter GPSs where we GPS all our shovel tests, any artifacts we find on the surface, and we create our, our site polygons from that. And these are all prehistoric sites. There's the Tennessee River. Um, and that allows us to have a, a set spot on the landscape where we, uh, you know, if the site's worthy of preservation, we can keep people out of it. And it also allows us to uh, overlay different imagery um, on these polygons. We've got this nice LiDAR hillshade model where we've flown over the arsenal and shot lasers at the ground with uh, super high resolution electronic distance meters and fed all those uh, little data points into a model where we can kind of create uh, the topography and it's a much better resolution than uh, you know USGS topo map. Um, if we have mounds or anything like that, they really pop in this imagery. Old trails, roadways, and everything. Uh, we can overlay historic imagery. This is a 1936 quad map. It actually shows little uh, houses where the farms were and the roads that were going through there at the time. And one of the uh, unique things we're doing, this is the riverbank. Um, you can see all the erosion going on here. When they draw the river down this time of year, uh, I get out there. Uh, at least weekly and just monitor for any illegal collecting activity for any uh, prehistoric features that might be eroding out of the bank and anytime I find a diagnostic artifact especially one that artifact collectors would be drawn to and carry away I'll collect it and GPS a, a point and over time we get these nice point clouds where uh, we've got concentrations of artifacts that date to particular time periods or are associated with particular cultures and we can really pin down the data from that. So even though it's just surface stuff and it's it's eroding out and it's somewhat out of context, in the grand scheme of things, it gives us some pretty cool data. All right, so that's finding the sites. After we find them, uh, we have to uh, do more careful evaluation of the sites to see if they meet the National Register criteria. And usually that uh, criteria for archaeological sites is uh, does it have integrity? Uh, you know, has it been plowed to the point where it's completely disturbed and everything's out of context, or has it been bulldozed? Um, and can it tell us something about a particular time period? So about half the sites end up, maybe a little over half, yeah, 60% uh, that we evaluate end up being like, yeah, this, ha this site has intact archaeological deposits, and it can tell us something. You know, it's kind of a low bar. You know, any archaeological site just about is going to be able to tell us some new information. Um, and so about 101 of the sites since 1978 have been evaluated in this way. Um, half of those since 2005, since I've been there. So we do about three, three a year on average. And so we take all the variables on why these sites are National Register eligible, and we feed it into a computer model uh, to get a statistical probability on um, the chance these sites are going to go eligible once we do these phase two evaluations. And that allows the, the master planners to, on the arsenal and the garrison to kind of have an idea of what they're getting into if they want to build a project in a particular location. Um, so we color code them and then the uh, engineers can look that up and be like, okay, this site's about 100% probability that it's going to go uh, National Register eligible. Maybe we need to shift our project over to this area. And so they created this de uh, developable, developable land um, parcel map where uh, they feed all the environmental constraints into it, so the archaeological constraints, threatened endangered species, floodplain, wetlands, uh, contaminated areas, everything, and create probabilities for all these different factors uh, that allow them to, you know, it might look like a really nice flat developable parcel where they want to uh, build some sort of army facility in the future, but if all these environmental constraints start piling up, it'll trickle down to the bottom of the pile. So that's phase one is out finding the sites, phase two is evaluating the sites. If the sites can't be avoided by uh, some sort of development, 
uh, we have to mitigate damage to those sites somehow. And most of the time, this is, uh, comes in the form of a data recovery excavation, where we go in there and almost completely excavate the entire site, so all the data is preserved. Uh, if there's human remains there, um, they can be preserved and repatriated at some point. Um, we record everything in a big report, big artifact inventories, and make that available to as wide an audience as possible. Um, before we can do that, though, we need to meet with all the stakeholders that might have a stake in uh, what happens to these archaeological sites. Um, the one we have to meet with every time is a state historic preservation officer. They're kind of the, the local oversight on this. Um, in Alabama, that's the Alabama Historical Commission. Uh, when it comes to these prehistoric sites or any site with a Native American component, uh, we meet with uh, or consult with anyway, at least 16 federally recognized tribes that uh, have some sort of traditional ties to North Alabama. Um, and we have to determine everything from disposition of human remains we encounter to uh, the, methodolo the archaeological methodology on how we're going to excavate this, to what happens to the artifacts afterwards, um, how we're going to publish it, distribute it, and everything. So we create this memorandum of agreement where it all becomes legally binding. And, uh, an example of that, we've only had two of these data recoveries so far. The first one uh, is on one of these big middle woodland village sites. It's a big middle woodland mid. Uh, this is Indian Creek. It's, it's our, uh, one of our biggest tributaries off the Tennessee River. You can kind of see the bluffs above the creek. These weird circular structures are a World War II era wastewater treatment plant that uh, is mothballed. It's no longer being used, but over time, you know, with these settling basins and stuff overflowing and them uh, spraying oils on the roads to keep the dust down and everything, this is a, a somewhat contaminated area that meets the threshold for cleanup. So this spot, they're going to have to dig, I don't know, the top five feet of soil out of it and cart all that off to wastewater treatment plant. Um, or, uh, sorry, a, a toxic waste dump. Um, all these structures, you're going to have to demolish those at some point and re-level off the land for them. So we did a complete excavation within this facility, and this yellow um, project area is where they're going to widen the main road going east-west across the arsenal and move all the uh, utilities into that spot. So we completely excavated that, too. And we found in this low area here, um, there was alluvium stratified by overflow of Indian Creek that had buried all these prehistoric archaic deposits. So we had middle, middle archaic and late archaic features there where people had camped there over the years on the floodplain. Um, this area, uh, we calculated based on the, the archaeological feature distribution that there were at least five houses there in the late middle woodland. And here's some pictures from the excavation. These are what our features look like. Um, you see that dark stain there. That's a late archaic pit, probably a storage pit or nut processing facility. Um, this is what we call a silo. It's this long kind of cylindrical pit, kind of bells out at the bottom with a flat bottom. Uh, based on late middle woodland, I think our radiocarbon dates are around AD 670 for this one. Uh, this would be a big storage facility. So this time, people are consolidating into villages. They were rapidly hunting out the surrounding area, uh, which kind of forced them into more uh, food production. So they're becoming more dependent on agriculture, growing native cultures like main grass and quinoa pod and uh, some squashes. And they would store these things in these underground facilities. And an interesting thing about this pit, uh, when we first started excavating within that wastewater treatment plant, all the engineers were like, you're not going to find anything. No, they've been using that since 1943. Everything's disturbed. It's got utility lines going all through it. Well, this is a water pipe. And you can kind of see the, the cross section of the utility trench right there. Cut right through the middle of this feature. But everything on either side was intact. And everything in the bottom was intact. And we ended up finding human remains all the way here at the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, so it was an important feature to excavate. And uh, we got a lot of good data and, and 
save some human remains for the big bulldoze. Um, here's just kind of an overview of the work inside that wastewater treatment plant. Here's the project area along Martin Road. Preservation was exquisite. This is a late middle woodland bone needle. Uh, found several of those. Uh, we ended up finding, I think, seven sets of human remains dating to the late middle woodland. Uh, one of them was middle archaic, one of the oldest sets of remains that uh, we've encountered on Redstone Arsenal. Um, these are middle archaic spear points, just a few examples of artifacts. This is a late archaic spear point. Most of the late middle woodland points were these little spike points. And the interesting thing about these, um, we think these mark the transition from use of uh, spear throwers, at lateral spear points. I beg your pardon? Oh, cool. Sorry. Uh, use of spear throwers to use of the bow and arrow. And uh, we did a lot of statistical analysis of these little spike points and determined that they were, most of them were, in fact, arrow points. Uh, so lots of people thought the bow and arrow had come on the scene, became uh, used here a little later. Uh, this brought that back to time a little bit. Uh, and we think they're developing the bow and arrow or adopting the bow and arrow at this time because outside groups are moving in. We're getting examples of uh, pottery and other artifacts associated with middle Mississippi Valley groups starting to come up river at this time. And a lot of our skeletal sample had signs of violent trauma. So things like scalping and uh, blunt force fractures to the skull um, from clubs. Uh, we call them parry fractures where the forearms fracture from blocking blows. Um, in fact, most of the skeletons had examples of this. So we think the reason they're moving into these villages at that time is something bad has happened. Uh, other groups are expanding into the territory, probably raiding, and the population is small enough where they're not able to muster the manpower to build stockades or some sort of protective structure around the villages. <coughs> so they're just consolidating in these little villages and hiding up the tributaries to avoid that main Tennessee River corridor. And Possibly these outside groups had already developed with bow and arrow. Uh, we think it was developed earlier in middle Mississippi Valley. Uh, so they probably had to quickly uh, adopt the bow and arrow to counter some of this, uh, weapon technology. And the other data recoveries we've done are on three uh, early 20th century house sites associated with African American landowners. Um, so Native Americans aren't the only stakeholders we consult with. Uh, we've got a, a huge descendant community of African American uh, families that were displaced when the Army moved in in the 1940s. Uh, so we can actually reach out to some of the descendants of the people that lived on these sites. Uh, we just finished uh, the draft report for this. Uh, and it was kind of experimental. A lot of these late sites, you know, they're 1930s. Uh, our grandparents could tell us, you know, exactly what people were doing on these sites. So, uh, is archaeological data redundant? Is it useful? Some of, those are some of the things we're evaluating this excavation. Um, also, as part of this, uh, since these sites were people who had been displaced by TVA, the original farms were in the floodplain. TVA comes in 1930s, floods the floodplain, buys these people out. They buy new land up in the uplands. Uh, seven years later, the Army moves in, displaces them again. So they were African-American landowners that were double displaced by federal uh, land acquisition. And so it was also eligible because of, of that historic trend. Uh, so to mitigate the eligibility for that, uh, we've done a, uh, we're in the process of doing a historical atlas of uh, African-American uh, communities in North Alabama and the top two tiers of counties. So uh, every county is getting its own report, and we're bundling up those reports and distributing that to all the uh, public libraries in North Alabama as a, as a good historical resource. Uh, so those are how we mitigate damaged archaeological sites. Uh, we have to do something similar for historical buildings if they're going to be impacted. Um, here's my building. This is uh, Werner von Braun, the head German rocket scientist. This is his office. And it's uh, the director of public works uh, has his office there now. We have to leave that office exactly how it was in the 1960s, including the old wall unit, air conditioners, the wood paneling, the furniture, and everything. Um, since it's it's such a big facility and, and kind of not really useful for the army to hang on to if it becomes obsolete, we can't really use that 
as a living museum. So instead we do a Habs Hair uh, Historic American Building Survey, Historic American Engineering Record uh, Survey of that building and come in and have an architect, architect to, like draw complete uh, blueprints of the whole thing, research the whole history of it, and uh, come up with files of, that we send to the National Archives for that. Okay, so that's, that's NHPA compliance, National Historic Preservation Act compliance. Uh, another law that comes into play is NEPA, uh, National Environmental Policy Act, and everything we do on Redstone Arsenal falls under NEPA, whether we screw in a light bulb or build a whole new, you know, 100 acre facility, uh, we all, we have to go through steps to evaluate the impact of all these different uh, environmental um, issues, again, from historic buildings to uh, threatened and endangered species, wetlands, the whole works. So we've got a, I'm, I'm in an environmental office for the Garrison Department of Public Works, and we've got a whole panel of experts there. We've got biologists, chemists, geologists, and everything, <coughs> and everybody reviews the plans for these undertakings to uh, see what kind of mitigation measures might be required. So if it meets what we call categorical exclusions, um, that means it's less than an acre in size, or it's going to impact an area less than an acre. There's no major environmental issues. We can do a record of environmental consideration for that. It's just usually like a five to ten page document where we just include all the comments from the environmental experts. If it's anything more than that, it doesn't meet one of these categorical exclusions. Uh, we do an environmental assessment, and then when we do that, it's, it's like a report where we go through each one of these environmental things and have experts write up exactly how it's going to impact it uh, in detail. And if, if the environmental impacts are not, you know, if they're manageable and we can mitigate them, uh, it stays environmental assessment. We publish a FONSI, a finding of no significant impact, and we'll send the EA off to the stakeholders, uh, send it off to the tribes for review. Um, we'll publish the FONSI in local newspapers, have a comment period where the public can review the EA online, or we'll send copies to the library or whatever, somewhere where people can read it. Uh, have a, I think it's 30 day comment period where people can send comments and concerns and do consultation that way. Um, since I've been there, we have never had to do an environmental impact statement. We've normally been able to manage all our environmental concerns to the point where uh, we can mitigate them. But if you can't, hypothetically, if you couldn't mitigate the impacts, uh, say, uh, there's a major plantation site that was just too big and expensive for us to do data recovery on, or we, the stakeholders couldn't reach an agreement on how to mitigate it. We'd have to do an envir environmental impact statement, and that's a big report, you know, where we detail everything, explain the environmental impacts, longer public comment period, um, and a lot more consultation. So up till now, anytime we have uh, environmental assessments, the tribes automatically get a copy and, and can send comments to us. Um, but the CADEX things that just get those record environmental considerations, uh, in meeting with a lot of the uh, consultants in the tribes um, in the State Historic Preservation Act and other stakeholders, no one wants to get a letter every time we change a light bulb or uh, you know fix a broken water line or something. So uh, we're still legally obligated to consult on that. We still want all the stakeholders to have a place at the table for these things. So uh, in consultation meetings, we've decided uh, together that we're going to just create lists like this every fiscal year and send it off to the tribes. And this just lists all those CADEX undertakings, um, the date they were done, and there's all my comments. And most of them are just, I have reviewed this project and found no significant environmental impacts in my area of expertise. Uh, but this is the first year that we've actually finalized our system where we can uh, kick out these lists and I'm about to send it off to all, all the tribes we consult with. So they'll have that information and be able to send us any comments or concerns. Uh, another law that falls under my office is the Archaeological Resources Protection Act. Uh, this is the only kind of criminal code um, with preservation law or cultural resource management. Um, it basically protects all archaeological resources on federal land. Uh, makes it illegal to collect artifacts, 
uh, sets up a permitting system for anyone who does any archaeological excavations out there, um, and sets up criminal penalties for violators. Um, here's Here's what our archive violations typically look like. The river bank is exposed and unprotected uh, beyond my monitoring it periodically. You see the footprints of some artifact collector coming up here. This is where a shell bin is eroded out. And they've come up there and raked the eroded shell looking for pieces of pottery or arrowheads or whatever that they can collect. So anytime I see that, we'll do a little investigation. We'll photograph the footprints, document everything, record the date. And I've got a file on that. We'll report it to the game warden, um, and he'll do a, an investigation. Um, we've only had two formal investigations done since I've been there. Uh, one of it was uh, where I think it was actually this one, where the individual actually got caught when, by one of our contracting ar archaeologists that was out there monitoring at the time, and he tried to, you know, explain the law, ask him to stop. And they got hostile and, and threatened to beat them up. So we reported that. Uh, lots of people investigated. He'd been a repeat offender on the wildlife refuge, so fish and wildlife. We we're trying to get this guy to. Never got a prosecution on it. And things like that are really hard to get a federal judge to pay attention to. They're like, well, you just have collecting arrowheads, no more. <coughs> but we do collect all that data, and it is significant data, and it is illegal. So we still uh, try to enforce that. Um, the other violation we never got a suspect for, uh, we just found were one of the historic farm sites, someone had been metal detecting on it, removed a bunch of artifacts. Uh, we put out cameras and monitored that, and did an investigation, did forensic analysis and everything, never pinned down who it was. Um, so no prosecutions to date. Do you know four prosecutions in all of North Alabama? TVA does a lot of prosecutions. They've had a lot of successful cases, mostly against diggers, like people actually going to uh, big shell middens and rock shelters and digging them out and stealing artifacts, disturbing burials, and so forth. Uh, I think since I've been here, they may have had half a dozen successful prosecutions under our book. Uh, another big one is NAGPRA, the Native American Graves Protection Repatriation Act. Um, since I've been there, uh, the, the, the act was passed in 1990. Um, everything that was collected pre-NAGPRA uh, uh, falls under Section 5 of NAGPRA. And we had uh, 11 sets of human remains that were collected prior to that, prior to me being there, that we repatriated. Um, since I've been there, we collected another 32 as part of some of these data recovery operations or salvage excavations where burials eroding out of the river bank in, in uh, the winter and we have to quickly excavate it and remove it before it uh, washes away or gets uh, impacted by looters. Um, so all those remains, 40 some remains, we uh, repatriated. Uh, the Chickasaw Nation took the lead on the repatriations. All the tribes got together and went through a, a multi-year process to figure out who the most appropriate um, claimants were, uh, published it, lots of comment periods, um, and uh, Chickasaw Nation took the lead, they claimed all the remains, we repatriated it, and they reburied it on post. Uh, we cited a, a specific, we call it our keep safe plot, where it's unmarked, uh, or it's, it's marked <coughs> in a specific way where people won't, uh, they won't draw attention. Um, it's cited so the Army will never build there. Uh, we have a memorandum of agreement with the Chicken, Chickasaw Nation that allows them to uh, visit it, to continue using it uh, for perpetuity. Um, we might have an issue coming up with it. Uh, the Army is redoing their uh, cemetery regulations. Um, right now, we've got 43 historic cemeteries on Redstone Arsenal that. Uh, are just kind of handled on an arsenal basis. The Army wants to centralize everything all the time, so they want to put all those under the Army cemetery <coughs> program. Um, so they will be treated in the same way that big military uh, cemeteries like Arlington or whatever are going to be treated. It will be the same authority to manage those. Um, so a lot of different rules. Uh, they'll be managed from afar. Uh, 
I'll probably be appointed the local cemetery liaison that'll manage them locally, but most of the decisions will be uh, probably done in, in the Pentagon. Um, we haven't determined yet, the Army hasn't figured out where this keepsake plot or similar reburial cemeteries fit in regulations. Um, the archaeologists and cultural resource managers all want it to be separate so that you know we can uh, manage them locally. Uh, ours will probably be, you know, since we have a memorandum of agreement, it'll be a legal, legally binding document, even if they change regulations. So it probably won't change anything for us, but I, I want to definitely let all the tribes know that uh, that's in the works. Okay, just a few things that are coming up in, in the near future. Uh, that may have impacts to um, prehistoric cultural resources or cultural resources in general. Um, the FBI and ATF, the Department of Justice, has a, they're expanding their footprint like crazy out on Redstone. Um, they, that facility that uh, we excavated, the three farm sites, it's right here. It's becoming the uh, Terrorist Explosive Devices Analytical Center, where anytime the FBI captures a bomb or like you know, these, these uh, letter bombs that people have been getting recently, those will eventually all go here where the FBI has a, a very modern lab where we'll, we'll do forensic analysis, pull fingerprints, pull forensic data, uh, dissect the bomb and uh, replicate the bomb. You know, there's another facility they have down here where they can replicate the bomb and detonate it to see how dangerous it would be and so forth, how sophisticated. Uh, so they're expanding. Uh, their fence is going to impact uh, uh, what's, it's a historic site, but it's probably an old slave cabin that was used up in the 1930s. Um, so we're going to excavate that, do an evaluation on it uh, this winter sometime. Um, FBI also has a ballistics range over here where they're going to do um, uh, projectile ballistic analysis and testing and evaluations. Um, when they designed it, they avoided all the, all the archaeological sites, and then after they started building it, suddenly they realized there was this big hill in the way. And I'm like, you're figuring this out now? Well, on top of the hill is a late archaic uh, campsite that we found lots of fragments of steatite bowls, soapstone bowls on, and uh, that kind of sends up red flag. That's unusual for these upland sites, and during this time period, uh, we find a lot of burials, not in Redstone, but elsewhere. TBA and WPA found burials where these steatite bowls were used as mortuary um, containers where they'd pack these bowls around uh, buried individuals. So that makes me worried that there might be human remains on the site. So we're going to do a very uh, rigorous phase two evaluation on that to make sure there's not intact uh, burials or any sort of human remains there. Um, Again, FBI, they've got a hazardous devices range where they train their bomb squads. It's down here. Uh, they're expanding their footprint too and want to improve their ranges. Those sites, uh, there's two big big sites that coincide there, two uh, big prehistoric sites that they impact if they do that. So we're going to evaluate both, both those sites this winter. Um, the wetland folks, the environmental office, wants to dam up a old Tennessee River slough about right here. Um, they want to dam it up to a level where it shouldn't impact any of our existing sites, but we're dealing with a lot of uh, deep alluvium there, so I'm worried that there's a potential for the, the archaeological deposits to extend into these sloughs, and I don't want there to be any, you know, dugout canoes or anything that might be buried in that muck. So we're going to do some deep testing, geomorphological testing, to make sure they don't disturb any archaeological resources there. Um, this is the U.S. Space and Rocket Center. If you've driven down I-565 towards Huntsville, here's Huntsville. Uh, you've probably seen a big Saturn rocket uh, standing there. That's the U.S. Space and Rocket Center. Uh, I think it's managed by the state of Alabama. Nice museum if you've never been there. Um, they want to expand, and the only place for them to go is on the Redstone Arsenal. So this is a little mountain here. It's called Ward Mountain. They want to lease uh, 140 acres around that mountain and have things like trails and ropes courses or uh, stuff, you know, different space camp uh, activities there. Um, so 
they're avoiding any of the archaeological sites there. There is a historic cemetery that uh, may or may not be a cemetery. We, it, it doesn't have any historical records or any physical uh, uh, remains of graves or markers or anything. But the army is always considered a cemetery. So I did a very detailed historical evaluation of it. We went in and stripped off a lot of the plow zone um, in, within the cemetery looking for grave shafts or whatever. Didn't find any, but we still can't prove that it's not a cemetery. So uh, the uh, Space and Rocket Center is going to have to avoid that. And that's the only potential issue of cultural resources. Um, here's gate nine. That's the main gate off by 565 on the Redstone Arsenal. They've cut all this empty land out up here and turned it into what we call an enhanced use lease, where the land remains army land, uh, an army managed government land. But we lease it to a private developer to build a big office park and labs and uh, retail outlets and hotels and things like that. Uh, and it's a 50 year lease, and after the 50 years is up, all that land reverts back to the Army, and the idea is the Army already have uh, an already built infrastructure there. Uh, it, they get the developer to pay for all the roads and utilities and buildings and everything. Um, right here in that enhanced use lease, that little patch of trees there, is a historic plantation site uh, that we've got a memorandum of agreement with all the stakeholders now to completely excavate that thing once once the development encroaches on that. Um, now all these little grassy spots here, uh, the garrison master planning is eyeing for future development. They don't have any specific things planned yet, but when we do do another data recovery or have to mitigate some archaeological site, <laughs> chances are it's going to be in this area. Uh, most of it's pretty high and dry, so we don't get a lot of National Register eligible uh, prehistoric sites, but we've got a lot of little farmsteads and things from early 20th century. And if the development encroaches on the mountain, all this forest here is this is Madden Mountain and Weedon Mountain, these nice Cumberland Plateau outliers. The whole southern and western face of the mountain are all these chert quarries uh, dating all the way back to probably the Paleo Indian times and used into the late woodland at least, where uh, Prehistoric people were going there and gathering up uh, naturally occurring shirt nodules and doing the initial uh, flaking of that so they could bring that back to uh, their habitation sites for making stone tools. Constant friction uh, between us and the engineers and uh, how we balance the preservation and, and the expansion of the arsenal. Um, anytime we do a brack, it's uh, the, the base relocation and, and closure act uh, where they evaluate all the military installations to see if, if they can stay or go. Um, everybody gets really stressed out and uh, the planners want to really diversify our mission and pack as many people onto the arsenal as possible to stay relevant and stay uh, part of the, the army mission. Um, so there's, there's this constant tension with that. Uh, a lot of cooks in the kitchen with all these different agencies and tenant organizations. So occasionally we get rogue tenants that think they own the land and they want to manage their own cultural resources without going through us and uh, bad things happen. So something I'm always watching out for. Um, lots of stakeholders and we get more stakeholders all the time, which is great. And that's why I do things like this to try to get word out about, uh, you know, we're all taxpayers. We all have a stake in this on some level and we want the public to uh, participate in the consultations and uh, public comments. We want people to know what's going on out there uh, so that we can balance their concerns with our mission. Uh, <coughs> a lot of federal laws uh, that we juggle. Um, sometimes wetland laws uh, conflict with cultural resources laws and we get these different tensions within the environmental <coughs> office where, hey, I, I need to evaluate this site. And, uh, no, you can't evaluate that during these months because it's a roosting area for an endangered bat or things like that. So another thing that we're constantly balancing. Um, the bureaucracy is not getting any less complex. Um, the Army wants to centralize everything. Just that's a, that's a military tendency. They want to put everything under some general depending on. Um, so we lose a lot of the local control that uh, is dependent on local knowledge 
uh, the other subject matter experts have. So something else we're struggling with. Uh, also an uninformed public that doesn't know the laws. Um, and again, that's, that's why I do things like that, to try to help get the word out. But the big picture, here's our goal. Um, Redstone Arsenal is the biggest contiguous archaeologically surveyed uh, plot of land uh, in the state, probably. Uh, we've been complete, completely archaeological surveyed. We're confident that we've located you know, upwards of 90-some percent of our archaeological sites. Uh, and I consider that a, a somewhat of a historical preserve. A lot of these sites, you know, at least half of them are National Register eligible, well preserved. Um, and as long as that remains military facility and federal land, it can't be touched uh, without going through these processes I've talked about. So here's, here's the eastern boundary of the arsenal. Here's uh, all these little red polygons are uh, archaeological sites, most of them significant and preserved. Um, and here's what's going on outside the fence. With the Tennessee Valley is just exploding. The Huntsville area is developing like crazy and expanding. We're on track to become uh, one of the largest, uh, I think we're, we're about to take over as the second largest uh, metro area in Alabama. Uh, residential development's encroaching right up to the gate. And in fact, this development, English Village, uh, was built in uh, the early 1990s. Uh, prior to that, the Army had funded an archaeological survey, uh, just kind of taking a statistical sample of this area, including areas off the coast. That project recorded a big village site that's just like that Lake Middle Woodland Village we mitigated. Right there. Um, and they, all they did was a phase two evaluation on the site and determined the site was eligible. But only if federal funding is involved would that site require mitigation. So since it was on private land and wasn't protected by the National Historic Preservation Act, a private developer came in and built this uh, development uh, and destroyed that mid. Um, in the phase two, they ran into uh, one set of human remains. So undoubtedly, uh, this was prior to the Alabama burial law, uh, dozens of, of prehistoric burials were destroyed by this development. So that is pounds of point home how important it is that uh, we're there, uh, we can preserve at least this sample of uh, Native American heritage in the Tennessee Valley. And our hope is to continue to do so and involve you all to the greatest extent possible. So, we got about five minutes, I think, for questions, if anybody has any questions. Yes? Uh, in other places in Alabama, are there anything like you going on that are preserving these places also? Anytime there's there's a federal agency involved, so TVA and, and uh, Fish and Wildlife Service have protected a huge uh, swath of the Tennessee River Valley uh, going right down immediately against the river. Um, they don't have, I mean, they've got thousands of archaeological sites. I think TVA manages something like 14,000 archaeological sites. Um, they don't have the manpower or funding to shovel test all their land. They're just watching the sites that are right on the riverbank and making sure they're not being looted. Um, the U.S. Forest Service has uh, Bankhead National Forest over here. Um, what is that, Winston and Lawrence counties. Uh, they have a huge uh, land holding. Um, they do the same thing, but they don't completely survey the entire area. They only go in and survey if they're doing a, a timber cutting or something. Um, the, any, anytime there's a federal highway or a highway project that receives um, uh, uh, U.S. Highway Commission funding or licensing, they have to do a survey. Uh, pipelines like natural gas and oil but do pipelines. do they act on, after the survey, do they act on things like what happened in the I mean, is there any kind of really, uh, what you are doing, I, I've been all over Alabama and I don't see anything like what you are doing here in terms of saving uh, They're all required, but we, we kick it up a notch. Yeah. <laughs> it's a shame, but it's not. Where do you deposit all of these artifacts? 
So all, all the artifacts, they get analyzed, inventory, put in a report. The physical artifacts uh, under a federal regulation all have to be curated in a federal facility. Uh, the main facility in the state for that is um, Erskine Ramsey Archaeological Repository in Moundville. If you ever been to Moundville, the, the big Mississippi mound site down below Tuscaloosa, they have a, a state-of-the-art curation facility there where it's all climate controlled and uh, secure. Um, so all our stuff goes down there. So anything really nice and it has educational value, I'll borrow back from them and put it on display. You're being, you're being kicked out. I'm, I'm getting the move. All right. Video production made possible by the National Trail of Tears Association. The Trail of Tears Association is a nonprofit, membership based organization established in 1993 with the purpose of passing the history of this significant event in Native American history onto future generations. If you're interested in finding out more about the Trail of Tears Association, or would like to become a member, please visit our website at www.nationaltota.com. There, you can learn more about the National Association, the state chapters, as well as how to become a member. To connect with the Association for upcoming events and to be notified when future videos are released, be sure to like the Trail of Tears Association Facebook page and subscribe to our National Trail of Tears Association YouTube channel. Thanks again for watching this video and for your support.